Okay, this lecture is going to be called The Role of Fat in Causing Dementia, and it's really part one. I'm going to primarily be talking about saturated fat and omega-6 fats, and really especially saturated fat. I also think that there's major problems with omega-3 fats and with MUFAs, monounsaturated fatty acids, especially, you know, everyone talks about olive oil. But I'm not going to go into that because that requires a whole bunch of different extra arguments that we're not going to get into for this talk. Okay, but just starting out, when you have a test tube of blood, the red blood cells are down here at the bottom. That's the hematocrit, the percent of the blood that is red blood cells, usually in the ballpark, 40 44%. The little white part here is the Buffy code from the white blood cells and the platelets. Plasma typically translucent. When somebody eats a high-fat diet, it's going to become more opaque. There's a good uh, film of that, of the picture of the blood test tubes from young athletes after a fat meal in the movie Game Changers about vegan diet and sports. Okay, this now shows <clears throat> what happens when you eat a high-fat meal. First of all, here's normal endothelial cells, the arterial lining cells, and they've got these proteoglycan proteins with a lot of heparin sulfates on them, making them very negative charged. That negative charge is called a zeta potential. All your blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, they all have a zeta potential, meaning a negative charge on their outer surface, so they repel each other. Um, the negative charge is generated by sialic acids, by cholesterol sulfates, and by heparin sulfates. Okay, so anyways, we need a high-fat meal. It causes activation of the neutrophils. Neutrophils are part of the innate immune system. They're white blood cells that fight infections. If you were talking about the game of chess, they would be like the equivalent of pawns. The neutrophils jump out there right into the front of the fight. And one of the things they do when they're activated is they release myeloperoxidase, typically abbreviated as here, MPO. The myeloperoxidase is very positively charged, so it's the opposite of the zeta potential. The word for that medical word is cationic, okay? And negative charge is also called anionic. Okay, so anyways, I remember a cat purrs, P for purrs, P for positive charge. Okay, so these MPOs, myeloperoxidase, they will then interact with the proteoglycans on the endothelial cell surface, and they will sort of neutralize them, if you will. And these proteoglycans that were once tall and proud will collapse down. And once they collapse down, by the way, proteoglycans, you can think of them as being like little trees on a hill, with the endothelial cell being the hill, and then being the trees, the proteoglycans. Okay, once they collapse down, then the cell binding receptors are exposed. You know, these might be like selectin proteins, for example, vascular cell adhesion molecule. Okay, well, anyways, they will then adhere to the neutrophil, and this can initiate uh, clotting potentially. So it's not good. You don't want this happening, okay? This is bad for blood flow. Um, the MPO has collapsed the glycocalyx. Okay, a little bit about diabetes. You know, people who are ignorant don't know much about diabetes, call it sugar diabetes, and they think it's a carbohydrate thing. No, no, no. Fat, diabetes is primarily a fat metabolism disease, okay? The people who actually know what they're talking about will tell you that. And that's been known a long time, going back to the 1920s, the papers of, you know, Jay Shirley Sweeney, you know, he made medical students diabetic, in a sense, on their oral glucose tolerance test just by feeding them high-fat meals. Nathan Pritikin used to joke he could make everybody diabetic, just feed him a high-fat dinner, and he said most Americans are diabetic if you check their oral glucose tolerance test after dinner instead of the usual checking them in the morning after they've been fasting overnight. Okay, so anyways, the fat typically first uh, accumulates in the skeletal muscle, and that will cause so-called overnutrition of the skeletal muscle, and that will lead to after-eating hyperglycemia, postprandial hyperglycemia. Um, subsequently, this... Chronic uh, hyperglycemia overeating will lead to fatty liver, and then the liver is no longer able to accurately sense the blood glucose level, and it'll continue to release uh, glucose into the blood um, even when the blood glucose levels are high, and you'll have fasting hyperglycemia. So this would cause after eating or postprandial hyperglycemia. This will cause fasting hyperglycemia. Okay, as you get a fatty liver, and fatty liver is super common. I see them all day long every day. Um, the next thing is you'll accumulate fat in the um, pancreas. And I'll see this all the time in CAT scan of the abdomen, fatty atrophy of the pancreas and diabetics. Okay, and by the way, this summary of fat moving here, 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 and there is large, sometimes called the ectopic fat theory of Gerald Shulman. And Roy Taylor and him worked together on this. 
Uh, they together did work over at uh, Yale with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which confirmed this is the first detectable finding of insulin uh, resistance, you know, that we can detect with our modern uh, detection methods. Okay, and so then you're not going to be able to make insulin. You're going to become insulin diabetic when the pancreas is no longer able to uh, produce insulin. So this is a little bit of an oversimplification. Uh, the loss of pancreatic beta cell function is a little more complicated than that, but that's, that's a good overall introduction to the topic. Okay, then there's cells like the retina, the kidneys, peripheral nerves that cannot control the rate of glucose uptake. It just comes into the cell. They don't have glucose type 4 transporters, and they can be overwhelmed by it, and that'll lead to retinopathy, diabetic retinopathy, uh, diabetic nephropathy, the peripheral nerves, diabetic neuropathy, endothelial cells, microvasculopathy, sometimes they'll call it endotheliitis, um, and, and you're screwed when you get diabetes in the foot because there's nothing to bypass to, whereby if you had a stenosis in the distal aorta, proximal iliac arteries in the pelvis, you can stent that, you can surgically bypass it. Down here in the foot, they're too small to bypass to, to plug in a distal graft, too small to stent, so they get tons of amputations. Diabetics every day in every Western hospital, diabetics are getting their toes and feet amputated and they're sitting below the knee too. Okay, so anyways, here's normal insulin sensitivity. After a uh, meal where you got some carbohydrates in the blood, some glucose in the blood, the pancreas releases insulin. Insulin binds the receptor on a skeletal muscle surface. It sends a signal that the glucose type 4 transporters, which transport glucose, should be sent up to the plasma membrane. And once they're sent up to the plasma membrane, they merge with it and they create this channel for glucose to come into the cell. And that's normal. So, you know, the majority of the postprandial spike in blood glucose goes into the skeletal muscles so they can store it as glycogen for future use. Okay, and then some of the extra, of course, will go to the liver, and it'll hang on to that with gly in the form of glycogen, you know, over the course of the next day or so until the person eats again. But anyways, insulin causes glucose type 4 transporters in the skeletal muscle. You need to know those glucose type 4 transporters to go up to the plasma membrane. Okay, here's excessive dietary fat, especially saturated fat will do this. Um, other types of fat, too, will, to a lesser degree, lead to insulin resistance, though. All fats make a person get fat. All oils are liquid fat. They're all bad for you, including olive oil. Okay, including omega-3s. All right, we'll talk about the details of that on a different day. Anyways, you're inhibiting electron transport in your inner mitochondrial membrane, and that's not good because this is how most of our energy is generated in the form of ATP. Okay, then, you know, how does it happen? Because the fat just keeps getting into the skeletal muscle. And they've tried to block it with, you know, uh, fatty acid transporter inhibitors, but it doesn't matter. It just keeps coming into the skeletal muscle. So the point is its concentration gradient in the blood determines the rate at which it enters the skeletal muscle. So the only smart thing to do is to reduce dietary fat. Okay, one of the things you'll hear, you hear the keto crowd saying, oh, well, we could lower, you know, their uh, blood glucose levels by putting them on a ketogenic diet and reducing carbohydrate intake. The problem, though, is with all the fat they're eating in that context, they're still having persistent um, insulin resistance, and if you give them an oral glucose tolerance test, they'll fail it. That's important to know because there's consequences, a lot of bad health consequences for having insulin resistance. Okay, now here's what happens with insulin resistance. When you've got overnutrition, excessive dietary fat, inhibiting mitochondrial inner uh, membrane electron transport, the mitochondria senses what is called overnutrition. And it sends a signal that says, hey, don't bring in any more nutrition. I can't handle what I've got. Don't let any glucose into the cell. So the glucose type 4 transporters are blocked. I have this red line for like a stop sign signal to not send those uh, glucose type 4 uh, membrane channels up to the plasma membrane so the glucose can't get into into the skeletal muscle and because of that the glucose level in the in the blood after eating is quite high so that's after eating is postprandial postprandial hyperglycemia okay one brief thing I'll show you about fructose fructose is a six carbon sugar after eating a meal almost all of it goes straight to the uh, liver through the portal vein the portal vein is a big vein that connects the gut to the liver. Um, the hepatic artery, on the other hand, it actually comes in in the liver hilum. I just drew it over here for simplification of this concept. The glucose comes into the liver and the six carbon phase of glycolysis uh, happens if the liver decides it wants to burn glycolysis for energy. 
And the key point is the regulatory step happens at the six carbon phase of glycolysis. This enzyme is phosphofructokinase. And so that's a real important point. In the six carbon phase, this is the first half of glycolysis, you've got tight regulation by PFK enzyme, phosphofructokinase, and it only runs when the person really needs energy. On the other hand, fructose can come in here in big amounts. If it comes in in little amounts, like you just ate a couple of fruits, you know, there's fiber in the fruit, there's other nutrients, it takes time to chew it, it takes time to digest it, there's not that much fructose, so it's not a big deal, okay? But if you drink, you know, you guzzle, let's say, you know, 24 ounces of super sweetened uh, junk food drink, and there's lots of high fructose corn syrup, there's no fiber to slow it down, it's absorbed as a big bolus, you get all that fructose charging into the liver, and fructose, again, it begins as a six carbon sugar, but it's converted to a three carbon sugar, and it enters glycolysis after the regulatory step. And the relevance is that when it enters so late at three carbon phase, there's very poor regulation of glycolysis in the second half, the three carbon phase of glycolysis. So it very quickly gets made into acetyl-CoA. And the liver's like, hey, I don't need to make this much energy. Why are you sending me all this pyruvate? And they just, the liver just in a sense says, screw it, make it into fat. So the acetyl-CoA is not wanted in the energy production uh, part of the pathways here for Krebs cycle, oxfos, and the mitochondria, for example. And instead, it's just made into fat. So that's why high fructose corn syrup in large amounts uh, tend to cause a fatty liver, okay? You also produce a lot of uh, uric acid the way the first uh, ATP metabolite is uh, processed. You, you get, so you got increased uric acid, hyperuricemia, and that ends up uh, contributing to insulin resistance as well. Plus the fatty liver predisposes to hyperlipidemia. Okay, typical red blood cells about seven microns in diameter. Typical capillaries about five microns in diameter. So the normal discoid shape of the red blood cell has to bend back on itself to pass through the smaller capillary. Okay, and if you eat a high fat meal and it causes the red blood cells to stick together, it functions as a bridging molecule, the chylomicrons or the uh, increased LDL cholesterol. They will make these red cells stick together and that can be called low formation. It can be called blood sludge and it increases the thickness of the blood, the viscosity of the blood. So blood pressure has to go up to pump thicker blood. You're pumping a milkshake instead of pumping water. Okay, the higher the LDL cholesterol, the higher will be the blood viscosity, the thicker the blood will be. The thicker the blood will be, the higher the blood pressure has to be. Zeta potential is a negative charge on the outer surface of red blood cells. Um, so you got bridging molecules that'll stick them together. LDL cholesterol will stick them together. Chylomicrons will stick them together. Fibrinogen will stick them together. It's a blood clotting protein made in the liver. It's one of the acute phase reactants as well. Elevated uric acid will function as a bridging molecule. IgM antibody with an acute infection will function as a bridging molecule. So a bridging molecule is something big enough and enough positive charges on it that will stick the two red blood cells together. So that's said to be overcoming the zeta potential. Now, Ansel Keys figured out that saturated fat was bad for atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease back in the 1950s. And so initially there was enthusiasm for trying to feed people uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids like the omega-6 cooking oils. But it turned out that when they tested it in the blood, it was even worse than the sap fat. So for example, Peter Kuo in Pennsylvania fed a bunch of cardiac angina patients a meal of primarily saturated fat. And at about four to six hours, four to seven hours, when they were in peak lipemia, they would get recurrent episodes of cardiac chest pain, uh, angina. Okay, and it was a rather, you know, kind of bold thing to do. Back in those days, you could get away with it because uh, they didn't have any stents. You know, if those patients had an MI, you know, they could have died. It's kind of a crazy thing to do. There's no IRB back in those days. Anyways, later in the 1960s, they repeated it with unsaturated fat, and what they found was that caused even more prolonged blood sludging. And, you know, the workers in the lab wanted to go home. You know, they started at 8, 9 o'clock in the morning. And these patients were still having blood sludge. They checked their, their blood lipids every 30 minutes with blood draws so they could see that the symptoms corresponded to peak lipemia. And you, you just had a more sustained plateau-like peak lipemia with the omega-6 cooking oil. So they're also quite bad for blood flow. And it's been shown in animal studies. It doesn't matter what type of fat you feed them. You know, if you feed them omega-6, omega-3s, PUFAs, or SAT fat, they all are atherogenic. Uh, 
Uh, you can take a look at the Armstrong studies on um, feeding uh, fat to animals. Um, okay, here's Rouleau. Normally blood flow should be like laminar, red blood cells in the center, white blood cells adjacent, and then the plasma on the outer surface, and that's a parabolic uh, velocity profile. Okay, so what happens when you're hypertensive, you hit the median divider between the external carotid to the face, internal carotid to the brain, kind of hard. You get this, when it bumps off of there, you'll get a lot of turbulent flow and retrograde eddy currents. And um, the net result is that when there's too much turbulent flow or retro, turbulent flow or retrograde eddy currents, it confuses the endothelium, uh, the far wall of the internal carotid artery. And this is by far the most common spot one sees atherosclerosis in the internal carotid artery. So that's kind of a key point too. Hypertension um, and fat are synergistic to cause atherosclerosis. And also atherosclerosis is a blood clot. You need to know that atherosclerosis is a blood clot. I've been studying atherosclerosis for many years, over 25 years, and I can tell you that's like about the most important thing you can know. Atherosclerosis is a blood clot. Once you understand that, you'll be able to make sense of all kinds of things that otherwise will just be like this big mystery until you understand that. And people say, well, how do you know atherosclerosis is a blood clot? You know, take a look at it. You can get um, uh, myocardial infarction in a, you know, a 15-year-old with sickle cell anemia because they clot off the artery, okay? And what do they say atherosclerosis do? It causes the artery to clot off, okay? Well, there it is. And there's other ways you can get that, too, from uh, high hematocrits, like you get these Tour de France bicycle riders who take too much epoetin, they raise their hematocrits, and they'll have myocardial infarctions as well. And then people always ask, well, can you reverse it? And you partially can. You can reabsorb what's called the lipid core in the atherosclerotic plaque, the necrotic core in the atherosclerotic plaque, the initial clot. That can all be reabsorbed. The sort of high cellularity fibrous tissue can be partially reabsorbed. The low cellularity fibrous tissue cannot be reabsorbed. The calcification part cannot be reabsorbed. Think of those as old scars on the artery. Okay, um, what happens is the clot forms on the surface of the, uh, the endothelium, and then the endothelium, then you got a clot on top of it, but then these endothelial precursors come and they cover it up. So the so called subintimal plaque is really just covered by endothelial precursor cells. Okay, and you'll also start making nitric oxide again real soon, so you can vasodilate the artery from that. So you can partially reverse it in terms of its old overall macroscopic size, and you can restore function in nitric oxide in the endothelial cells such that they then, that will dilate the artery. Okay, when you got chronic diabetes or hypertension, so normally here's a normal capillary. The red blood cells are flowing through in this direction. They're bent back on themselves as one would expect. We talked about that. The endothelial cells are in the background here, spindle-shaped. There's a nucleus of them. The yellow is for the basement membrane of the endothelial cells. The green are the uh, uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. Okay, so the point is they're delivering oxygen pretty well here. You see a lot of little blue circles for oxygen delivery to this neuron. Well, once you got diabetes, you're going to get thickening of this, of this uh, basement membrane here um, from the diabetes, and that's going to decrease oxygen delivery. But you're going to get thickening, thickening of the vascular smooth muscle, hypertrophy, you're going to get some collagen laid down in that area, fibrosis, scar tissue, and all of that's going to decrease the ability of the cells to deliver oxygen to the, to the neuron. In addition, you have a decrease to some extent. I think the amount is variable, but you'll get a decrease in endothelial nitric oxide production as you get older. So all of these things can diminish uh, glucose and oxygen delivery, and we're especially concerned about oxygen to the neurons. Here's a little bit about the structure of a fat. You got a carboxylic acid, and it's an acid, and that's why they're called fatty acids. Okay, so here's the carboxylic acid, and that's the acid end. Because of the oxygens there, it's a little bit polar. It's polar because you have a different electronegativity, desire to grab electrons between that of the carbon and that of the oxygen. Okay. Whereas over here, the tail of the fatty acid, which is just and let's say, and this is a sat fat, meaning no double bonds, you just got carbons and hydrogens. And carbons and hydrogens have very similar electronegativities, meaning desire to grab electrons. And because of that, there's no charge on them. The fatty acid is amphipathic, also called amphiphilic, meaning that it's like an amphibian, can live on land and water, in the sense that the charged um, polar acid group here uh, by itself will be soluble in water, but this... Um, nonpolar uh, 
uh, tail of just carbons and hydrogens is uh, hydrophobic, nonpolar, okay? But having these two properties uh, becomes relevant in some situations. Okay, here's a couple different types of fatty acids. Here's a MUFA, monounsaturated. So unsaturation means a double bond, one double bond. And the classic MUFA is olive oil, okay? Saturated fat, you know, the classic thing you know about that is it mostly comes from animal foods. Okay, PUFA is polyunsaturated fatty acid, and there's two main categories of them, and these are the two main essential fatty acid categories. This is the omega end over here, and so you count the carbons, one, two, three. So at the third carbon, a double bond here would be an omega-3 fatty acids. Four, five, six, and this is an omega-6 fatty acid, okay? There's usually one intervening carbon with no double bond on it, and then you'll have another double bond, all right? This intervening carbon, which uh, will have two hydrogens on it, is called a methylene group, okay? And the one in between the two double bonds is specifically called the methylene bridge carbon, okay? So again, you count from the methyl end, which is also called the omega end, to determine if it's, uh, you know, an omega-3 or an omega-6 or a type of uh, PUFA. Oh, okay, because that methylene bridge is not hanging on to its hydrogen very tight. That hydrogen can get plucked off. When it's plucked off, you've got a residual free radical, and that can bind with oxygen and form a peroxide. Peroxide is when there's two oxygens in a row. This also has an unpaired electron in the outer orbital with the net result that it's hyperreactive, and you can get a chain reaction of these reactive oxygens that can destroy membranes, like in the mitochondria or the plasma membrane of the cell. And that's why there's a danger, especially to these PUFAs. The more double bonds a fatty acid has, the more vulnerable it is to lipid peroxidation. That's why they tell you if you buy omega-3 fats, you must keep them in a radio-opaque bottle, and you must keep them in the fridge. Otherwise, they'll undergo this and become rancid pretty quick. That's another reason why I'm not that enthusiastic about them. You know, you got to put them in the fridge. They're going to heat up pretty fast when you, uh, you, know, you put them in your mouth. Okay, hydroxynonanol is a, is a byproduct of lipid peroxidation, which what we were just talking about, those reactions in fatty acids. And so this hydroxynonanol also will inhibit the inner mitochondrial membrane uh, production of ATP. So that's a problem. You don't ever want to eat omega-6 oils ever would be my thought. Okay, this is just a little bit about leaky gut. I recently gave another lecture on this in more detail, so we're not going to go into that right now. But the bottom line is when you have a leaky gut, you lose the integrity of your tight junctions. And when those break apart, bad things can get across your gut lining. The purple here is for bacteria. The LPS is a bacterial endotoxin. You can also get LTA, bacterial endotoxin. And you can get pro chunks of protein coming through and confusing your immune system, leading to autoimmune disease. Uh, so the bottom line, it's all bad. And how do you prevent leaky gut? The most important thing is eat more fiber because the uh, fiber is converted into short-chain fatty acids like the 4-carbon butyrate by the good bacteria in the gut. And that's used by the enterocytes, the gut lining cells, to make tight junctions. Okay, And that will prevent leaky gut. And then avoid all the things that sort of are harmful to the bacteria like antibiotics, oils, Okay, avoid things that de that decrease blood supply to the gut. <laughs> you know, chronic atherosclerosis, excessive stress, caffeine, etc. Okay, if you have leaky gut, the bacterial endotoxins, LPS from gram-negative bacteria, LTA from gram-positive, that, by the way, is lipopolysaccharide. That's called lipotychoic acid. Those can get across your gut lining and get into your blood, and they cause problems. They'll change the way fibrinogen, uh, blood clotting protein uh, structure is worked. You know, typically the secondary protein structure is that it's alpha helix, like a cylindrical cil cylinder, and the hydrogen bonds are within the same molecule, so that's intramolecular. However, in this context, what happens is now they become flattened. That's called beta pleated sheets. Secondary protein structure, beta pleated sheet, which just means flat. Now they can stack up like a deck of cards stack up like a deck of cards, and you've got hydrogen bonds in between the different molecules. So that's called inter. Inter means between. Intermolecular hydrogen bonds. And these can get very big as these stack up. And the bigger a molecule gets um, in solution, the more likely it is to precipitate out of solution. So that's not good. The molecule becomes non-functional when it precipitates out of solution.
and it forms these clots. Like a normal clot looks a little bit like spaghetti, but these clots, they become much more irregular. So here's a relatively normal clot looking like pieces of spaghetti, the fibrin going into fibrin. And then here they call them dense matted deposits. So just a tiny bit of LPS. And also excessive free iron in the blood can do this as well. Um, and uh, viruses can do this as well. They will cause these dense matted deposits, amyloidogenic. The word amyloid means that transition from uh, alpha helix cylinder shape configuration to uh, beta pleated sheet flattened configuration. And anyways, it's an amyloid form of a clot and the relevance as well is that it's very difficult to dissolve from the blood. So these are more dangerous blood clots because you form one of these in an area that needs a lot of oxygen and you might not be able to dissolve it before that neuro neurons are dead. Okay, so here we talked about this, the uh, excess dietary fat, especially saturated fat. But the lipid peroxidation byproducts are meeting omega-6 cooking oils that have undergone lipid peroxidation. You produce this HNE thing. It's a form of a toxic aldehyde called hydroxynonanol. Hydroxynonanol, HNE. You're going to hear that a lot if you study uh, neurodegeneration. So anyways, that can also inhibit you know, what is called complex 5 of the inner mitochondrial membrane, the ATP synthase enzyme. So that will also decrease the mitochondria's ability to produce energy, which is a big deal. Okay, we talked about Jack Delatore, dementia theory multiple times, the mouse equivalent theory. He would tie off the internal carotid artery in a mouse's neck. He actually tied off all the different arteries and saw what happened, but for purposes of discussion, it's best to just focus on the internal carotid artery. And basically, two months later, middle-aged and older mice were demented. And he came to the conclusion it was due to chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. And it's actually a very brilliant statement. And people say, well, so what? Not that many people have carotid artery occlusions. Yes, that's true. But tons of people have hypertension. And if the hypertension is not well controlled, so to speak, the high blood pressure will damage the arteries, causing what we just talked about, you know, thickened capillary walls, decreasing gas exchange, which is the equivalent of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. If, on the other hand, you overtreat the hypertension, then you don't get enough blood up to the top of your head, the top of your cerebral cortex, your brain, the convexity, okay, the frontal lobes and the parietal lobes. Well, guess what? That's really common, okay? I mean, why do we even generate a blood pressure? Most important part of it is to go against gravity and get blood to the top of the brain. All right, so what else could do that? Congestive heart failure. I call these mouse equivalents. Atrial fibrillation. Okay, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, post-cabbage uh, coronary artery bypass graft hypotension, you know, the anesthesiologist running the pressure low because they don't want to bleed out at the anastomosis. Okay, you can also drop glucose availability to the brain with obstructive sleep apnea and oxygen delivery. Um, if you over overdose yourself on diabetes medications like insulin, you can be low in blood sugar at night. And they found out that's a lot more common than was previously thought because nowadays they've got continuous glucose monitors that can check for that. It used to be they'd only stick their finger a couple times a day and they would have no idea what the sugar really was at night. Okay, here's just showing the brain. This is internal carotid artery comes up into the brain. It bifurcates. You can't see the ACA anterior cerebral artery, but you can see the MCA middle cerebral artery. These are the lenticulostriate arteries going into the basal ganglia. And then this is the, the continuation of the middle cerebral artery, okay? It's going to be called the M. This is the M1 segment, M2, M3, and then M4 up around the convexities. And this is ascending M4, descending M4. But the relevance being that hardest spot to get blood to is right here where the skull and crossbones is. Because once the blood gets up to the top of the convexities, it has penetrating arteries that have to feed this segment, which is a relative end artery segment, meaning there's not good collaterals there. If your pressure is too high, you might shear off one of these lenticular strides and get a hemorrhagic lacuna or infarction in the basal ganglia. I see those every day. Okay, then <clears throat> if you don't have enough blood up here to the top of the convexities because you're you're relatively hypotensive from overtreating your hypertension, or you just had chronic hypertension damaging these arteries. You can't get enough blood to this area. Um, diabetes can also uh, damage the small vessels trying to feed this area with blood. And that'll lead to a lot of these small strokes. So here's a normal brain. This sequence is called a flare sequence. And so the cerebral spinal fluid uh, signal is suppressed. That's why it's dark. Okay, so this is normal. There's no abnormal signal here. There's a tiny bit of hyperintensity from the normal corticospinal tracts. That is normal, okay? Here is abnormal. And this is a pretty much typical looking, let's say, 80-year-old. 
Okay, you got all this hyper intensity here. The stuff touching the ventricle would be called juxtaventricular. The stuff near the ventricle but not touching is periventricular. The stuff out here near the cortex is going to be called subcortical. So the way I would read this brain MRI would be extensive juxtacortical, periventricular, and subcortical flare hyperintensity because the name of the sequence is flare. It's really a, it's like a CSF suppressed T2. Anyway, so the relevance is this is bad, okay? Um, and this is common. This would be a typical 80-year-old. Now, don't get me wrong. I do see a lot of people in their 70s and 80s with nothing. No, none of these silent strokes. These are silent strokes, okay? They're usually silent. Sometimes they're symptomatic, but they're often silent initially, except for the patient becoming progressively cognitively demented, uh, cognitively slowed, and slowing of their muscular, musculoskeletal reflexes, responses, and all their motions, okay? You don't want to be like this. You want to be like this. And lots of people are. I had a lady doctor friend who did her residency at a city hospital next to a Chinatown, and they were amazed at how nice a lot of the brains looked on the old Chinese people that were eating a lot of rice diets. Very little cerebral atrophy, very little uh, in the way of uh, silent strokes. Okay, uh, so anyways, Here's just looking at the inside of a cell. Let's say it's a neuron. And the point of the matter is, you know, more than half of the energy, about two-thirds of the energy goes to this pump, the potassium-sodium pump. And that's used to maintain the plasma membrane voltage gradient. Excuse me. And typically it's going to be about negative 65, maybe negative 70 millivolts. The concentration of sodium is going to be about 10 times higher, 140, outside the cell than inside the cell, 14. So this is a gradient, both an electrical gradient and a chemical gradient because the difference in concentration of sodium. And that sodium really, really, really wants to get into the cell. And you can couple moving that sodium into the cell with pumping calcium out. This is called the NACA exchanger for sodium calcium exchanger, often abbreviated NCX. All right, this is primary active transport because an ATP is used directly in the reaction. This is called secondary active transport because... The benefit of this ATP produced gradient is coupled to, if you will, becomes like a, a water mill wheel, and that gets calcium pumped out of the cell. You always need energy to pump calcium out of the cell cytoplasm because calcium concentration outside the cell is incredibly high. It's like you know more than 10,000 times higher than it is inside the cell. Calcium is a big deal because when calcium is elevated in the cytoplasm, it causes the cell to do whatever that cell does. So if it's a neuron, it'll cause it to release this neurotransmitter. Most common neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate. It's about 90% of brain neurotransmitters. So you'll have vesicles with glutamate, and this increased cytoplasm calcium will be the signal that they go merge with the plasma membrane at the, syn at the synapse, synaptic cleft, and release their neurotransmitter. We're going to come back to all this stuff. The reason I'm going through it is we're going to have to come back to all of it. It's going to be relevant. It's going to be important. So here's a typical action potential in a neuron. Here's a cell body where the DNA is, some mitochondria, these are the dendrites, you know, the receiving signals for this neuron. Then when an action potential is fired, it'll typically start right over here, right where the connection is between the cell body and the axon. This is sometimes typically called the axon hillock. The axon potential is conducted primarily with sodium. When you reach the synaptic terminal, you'll then have voltage-gated calcium channels. And when that calcium comes into the cell, and it'll open up because of the depolarization related to this action potential having just occurred. It'll let calcium enter into the cytoplasm of the axon terminal, and that will then be the signal for these uh, neurotransmitter vesicles to go to the plasma membrane of the synaptic cleft, here's synaptic cleft, and release their neurotransmitter into it, which will then diffuse across to the other side and activate this postsynaptic neuron. And that's your basic neurotransmission. In the real world, it gets a little more complicated than that because they're could be more than one type of receptor. For example, these are the most important uh, neurotransmitter in the brain is glutamate. It's about 90%. That's like not a misprint. 90% of um, neurotransmitters in the brain. I'm currently reading a book called uh, Glutamate, the Sculptor and Destroyer by Matt Madsen. He devoted his whole life to researching glutamate. And uh, he talks about how it's 90%. And believe me, that's what he does every day for a living. He's a pretty smart guy. Because uh, the old estimates were lower than that, you know, 70, 80%. Now that's 90% of brain neurotransmitters.
Anyways, it'll bind the AMPA receptor, which is a sodium channel, let sodium into the neuron, depolarizes the neuron. As the charge gets more positive inside the neuron, the magnesium will jump out of the center of the NMDA uh, receptor. Glutamate will bind to that, and that lets calcium into the cell. That raises cytoplasm calcium. And there's actually another way that glutamate will do it. Glutamate can bind to these receptors over here called metabotropics, and those have a G-protein coupled receptor. You don't need to know all these details. I'm just going through this because I'm going to have to go over this with a doc tomorrow. Um, and then this will activate something called phospholipase C. The way I remember phospholipase C is you're in the plasma membrane, so phospholipids, so phospholipid C you could think of it as. Um, and then C for cleaves, cuts something. Yes, and it does cut something, okay? It cuts PIP2. This is called PIP2, which is a combination uh, phosphatidyl and acetal and uh, uh, diacylglycerol, the part that's in the plasma memory. We typically abbreviate that as a DAG, so D-A-G, DAG. And then once you clip this off, the phosphatidyl and acetal, that becomes called IP3, okay? And there's a joke. It's like the old joke in the pool, IP freely. Okay, so anyways, the point of the matter is the DAG will stain the plasma membrane and it'll move over and activate something called protein kinase C, which activates proteins, all right? The IP3 will go to the endoplasmic reticulum and it'll cause a release of calcium from these IP3 receptors, IP3 receptor channels, okay? And so all of this is going to release more calcium into the cytoplasm, all right? That's the only point is you're doing a lot of things here to ramp up calcium real fast. And then when you send this glucose neurotransmitter from the presynaptic neuron here to the postsynaptic neuron, it'll depolarize it, meaning raising its charge. And in the small amounts, that's normal. That's what happens all day long. But if this gets too high of a, a massive a, of a depolarization in the postsynaptic neuron, you can let too much calcium in and then that can activate destructive pathways. And that's called excitotoxicity when you overstimulate a neuron um, and it doesn't have the energy to meet that overstimulation and that can be damaging to it, can even cause that neuron to die. Okay, so excitotoxicity is a big deal. I've given a bunch of previous talks about it. Just be aware that such a thing happens, overstimulation leading a neuron to die. There's tons of things that raise cytoplasm calcium and most of them are bad, you know, traumatic brain injury, and then there's an equivalent raising of it because you don't have the energy to pump stuff out, like if you inhibit your mitochondria, if you inhibit your circa. Circa means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium, calcium ATP, is, and it really means endoplasmic reticulum pumps. The sarcoplasm word is just a carryover from its role in skeletal muscle. Okay, so anyways, this is something worth knowing. A lot of things elevate cytoplasm calcium. All these stimulates, MSG, MFG, aspartame, caffeine, glyphosate, uh, they're bad. That's another reason why I recommend no caffeine, and I don't care what people trying to BS the public tell you about caffeine and coffee being good for you. It's not true, and it's pretty obvious. You know, everybody knows stress is bad for you. Caffeine raises the same hormones, so obviously that's bad for you. Okay, so anyways, here's the cytoplasm calcium, and again, this is just showing you a whole bunch of things that will raise cytoplasm calcium. All kinds of problems, all these toxins we just spoke about. Um, beta amyloid protein does it as well. Um, and we're not going to go into all the details of that right now. Be aware that things that are good are things that raise, you know, sy systemic, um, like peripher peripheral part of your body, nitric oxide, like getting some sunshine, eating some greens. All right, and then we get into, you know, my theory, the Peter Rogers uh, MD theory of dementia. And so basically, you've got a metabolic rate and you've got a glucose oxygen delivery rate. And I jokingly called it, you could have called it OGD, that's what it's usually called in the books, oxygen glucose delivery rate. But as a joke, I call it the glucose oxygen delivery rate because obviously it spells an interesting word there. Okay, so MR is metabolic rate. Now, if you drop the glucose and oxygen, oxygen delivery due to atherosclero atherosclerosis in those arteries, due to diabetes and hypertension, you're gonna have less energy uh, sources, glucose and oxygen being delivered to the metabolic rate. So I, what I've done is I dropped the GOD down here to show that you've now got some uncoupling. Normally the amount of glucose and oxygen delivery is precisely coupled to meet the metabolic rate of the neuron. But all of these things, over treatment of hypertension, you know, dropping your perfusion per pressure of the brain, is gonna drop the glucose and oxygen delivery. Uh, excess dietary sodium causing a lot of vapors from constriction, that'll drop it. High fat meal, 
causing blood sludge, low formation, that'll drop the ability to deliver oxygen. Some drop in this delivery capacity happens with aging. AFib, CHF, less blood pump to the brain, going to drop this a bit. Okay, then I mentioned inhibitors of circa and mitochondria calcium pumps because what's happening is you can't make as much ATP when you inhibit your mitochondria. This actually should be over on this side. When you inhibit circa, you can't get the calcium out of the cytoplasm, so you're going to ramp up the metabolic rate. You're going to keep that neuron more active. Um, low potassium and magnesium. Magnesium is blocking the NMDA receptor, so it's going to increase your energy demand if you can't block that because you're going to have more calcium in that cytoplasm. Um, potassium is a vasodilator, which helps to get more blood supply to the tissue. When you have less blood supply because you're high in sodium, low in uh, potassium and magnesium, it also contributes to vasodilation. Um, you're going to get less net glucose oxygen delivery. Okay. Then if you increase the metabolic rate due to stimulants, you know things like caffeine, MSG, MFG, MFG is manufactured free glutamate, excessive psychological stress, doing the same thing, sleep deprivation, doing the same thing, other stimulants, tobacco, amphetamine, attention deficit meds, glycine phosphate, glyphosate, like from Roundup, that's also an excitotoxin because it mimics glycines, like glycine phosphate, such that it also binds to the NMDA receptor and can increase its activity. BAP just means beta amyloid uh, protein polymer, and that's the one that's associated with so-called Alzheimer's. We'll talk about that some other time. But the net point is when you widen this gap too much between the metabolic rate of the neuron and the available glucose and oxygen delivery, if this gap gets too wide, you, then you'll have more severely uncoupled um, the neuron and the vascular delivery system of oxygen and glucose, and the neuron will just be at higher risk to go into programmed cell death, what's called apoptosis, whereby it's just recycled uh, then by the microglia, the big macrophage in the brain. Um, rather than if you have a stroke, it happens so suddenly that the plasma membrane of the cell would lyse. With apoptosis, the plasma membrane does not lyse. It just gets recycled sort of cleanly, so there's nothing to see when you look at it under a microscope except a decreased number than what's expected in neurons. Okay. Okay, and then here's a typical thing that happens in medicine. You know, I uh, knew that I'm reading a lot about neurophysiology and stuff and I you know I know mitochondrial inhibition is a big deal and I know it occurs but off the top of my head I didn't really remember the names of all the mitochondrial inhibitors so I go back to my college and medical school biochemistry books and I own like about five biochemistry textbooks and none of them had any type of useful information about mitochondrial inhibitors so then I start looking up in the journal articles, and I'm like, holy crap, I very quickly found over 50 mitochondrial inhibitors, and lots of them are very common. We just talked about fat, especially sat fat. We talked about H&E, and lots of other things here. You can look at them for yourself, uh, but they're, they're real common. I have specific lectures all about mitochondrial inhibitors. Okay, so the same old story. You inhibit the mitochondria, you've got less ability to produce energy, and you're going to worsen that situation there. As people get older, they get more iron overloaded. Men in their 20s because they stop growing. Women after they become postmenopausal. The relevance is that they accumulate iron. They're more likely to have free iron, which is bad. You know, iron's like a fire. You want iron in your fireplace. You want it in your stove, but nowhere else. And the same thing in the human body. You want it in your electron transport proteins. You want it in your enzymes. You want it in your hemoglobin, but you don't want it randomly in other places or it just damages tissue, it predisposes to uh, lipid peroxidation, and that can cause the formation of hydroxyl radicals that can then <clears throat> lead to lipid peroxidation in the inner mitochondrial membrane, for example, can also damage DNA. Okay, and then, you know, part of this talk was what is the effect of high-fat uh, diet on cognition, and of course, high-fat diet leads to diabetes, um, eventually, and then the, the big thing here is, you know, in the textbooks they'll mention glucose type 1 transporters at the blood-brain barrier, glucose type 3 transporters on the neuron surface, but they forget to mention you've also got glucose type 4 transporters, and those glucose type 4 transporters are needed. They only go up to the plasma membrane in the context of binding with insulin and having adequate insulin sensitivity. So when you've got insulin resistance, it also occurs in the brain. It's not just a peripheral thing. You can't get enough glucose into this neuron, so if the neuron needs to really ramp up its activity, these guys will not come up to the plasma membrane, and then that neuron is screwed.
Okay, so here's a little more detail on why the neuron is screwed with insulin resistance when you suddenly have to ramp up metabolic activity for that neuron. So here's the glucose type 4 transporters. And because there's insulin resistance, um, they can't get up to the plasma membrane. That means the glucose cannot get into the neuron. That means that the person has ramped up metabolic activity. Like let's say they're walking through a, uh, a path in a forest or a jungle. You know, that's why you have a brain. So you can walk down a path in a forest or a jungle and survive. Okay, and there's a bunch of coyotes, for example. They want to ramp up metabolic activity. The endoplasmic reticulum is actually has little finger-like projections that contact the mitochondria. And these are called MAMs, mitochondria-associated membranes. And so in this context of needing to ramp up activity, they will start sending calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum, it's a storage uh, site for calcium, into the mitochondrial matrix. And the benefit normally would be that causes upregulation, an increase in Krebs cycle enzymes. So you can speed them up and you can generate more energy from the mitochondria. But here's the problem, that when there's insulin resistance, you can't get these glucose transporters up to the plasma membrane, so this neuron cannot get in enough glucose. But the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria don't seem to recognize that as well as they should. So there's a tendency for the endoplasmic reticulum to keep on pumping calcium into the mitochondrial matrix, but it doesn't have the glucose to run all these enzymes and energy production systems without that glucose. So you can get an excessive amount of calcium sent into the mitochondrial matrix, and that can cause uh, proteins to precipitate and then can cause this individual mitochondria to die. And if too many of your mitochondria die, then the whole cell will die. It'll go into cell death, program cell death, apoptosis. So this is another way that diabetics you know, can't handle intense uh, sudden intellectual activity increases. Um, so it's another reason why they have a tendency to become cognitively impaired as they lose more neurons. And that's basically it. I know I went a little fast. I just kind of had to crank through these. Um, I, I've gone through this in more detail on other lectures. Um, so anyway, so I hope that was helpful and interesting, the role of fat in causation of diabetes and cognitive impairment.